I'd like to welcome in my guest, comedian, actor, author, podcaster, Hurricane Finesse Mitchell, Mitchell to the show. Finesse, what's going on, man? What's going on, my brother? What's going on? Uh, hey. You. Yeah, I appreciate you doing this, man. So Finesse is going to be at the Dania Improv in Dania Beach, January 7th and 9th, performing there. You can all check him out there. Uh, you excited? I know Look, when I've been watching your podcast and with Understand This or anything you're doing, you're always representing the U. Um, what is it about the Miami Hurricanes that has you excited? And you played football there for people that don't know. And we will definitely get into that here in a little bit. Everybody knows the U is a culture. And I didn't know it at the time. I just knew that at the time, being from Atlanta, you know, watching Miami Hurricanes play Notre Dame or any, uh, just watching them just kick everybody's butt. I remember uh, uh, they called him Tiger, Tiger Clark. You know, Clark um, he was the middle linebacker. He was nasty. He was ferocious. I don't know. I wanted to play ball down there. I wanted to go to Miami. And once I got down there, I realized, Chris, oh, my God, this place is infectious. And so once I left there, I had laid so much on the line as far as just like loving that city, loving the school, loving the culture, appreciating the education and everything I learned there that once I left there, I was just one of these cult hurricane people walking around the country talking about the youth, talking about Miami, the orange and green, fighting if anybody said anything otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fidesz, how excited are you? You know, Mario Cristobal takes over as head coach. There's a lot of excitement um, amongst Miami fans. How excited are you about this? I know people are ex going to be expecting big things. You know, just what do you think this is going to be like? You know, how excited were you to uh, form a teammate of yours? You know what, man? Um, back then, I, you know, it wasn't until I saw that 2001 team that I saw that I used to say, hands down, we had the best college football team. You know, I know Michael or Michael Irvin will disagree, but I, I used to say that early 90s, that 89 to like 92, 93, these guys were some monsters, Chris. I mean, at every position. And so uh, I remember uh, Mario Cristobal, his brother, uh, Louis Cristobal, um, you know, they held down the line along with Leon Searcy and uh, 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 Kevin Jones, Claude Jones. It's it just some – Mike Sullivan. I don't know if you remember these names, but these these guys look like the pros back then. And um, to see Mario's trajectory over the years, uh, staying close to football and coaching and, and all that, you know, it, just seeing his path, I used to always say, you know – you kind of need somebody to um, who kind of helped invent that culture to, to bring that certain football culture back to Miami because it was lacking. I always felt like watching the new Hurricanes teams that they had it in spirit, but it just wasn't bone deep, if, if that makes any sense. And um, so to answer your question, short answer, I'm very excited. I know he's a tear on the recruiting trail. And I know he's well respected in South Florida and all over the country. So I think it's a definite great hire for the Hurricanes. And um, I thought back then when they were saying Manny Diaz, Mario Cristobal, I, I was kind of leaning towards Mario just because I had that that relationship, you know, from playing with him and experiencing his personality. So um, I think the Canes got a good get. Finesse, you, you talked about recruiting here, and I've you know just doing some research. I, I've seen you say that you pay attention or, or you have paid attention to recruiting at, at one point. I, I think anytime, I think fans that are watching the show can relate to this. Anytime a fan goes deep into recruiting, you can definitely tell that they're those diehard fans. How much do you stay up on it? Do you enjoy that, you know, kind of paying attention? I, and again, I know you're busy and it's sometimes tough to follow at times, but do you still enjoy uh, I'm, paying I'm, I'm, ne I'm never too busy for the Hurricanes. That's my team. That's my sports team. Miami Hurricanes, Atlanta Falcons. A lot of times when Atlanta Falcons lose, the Hurricanes will lose. You know what I mean? If the Hurricanes win, my Falcons might win. But uh, I check it every day, man. It's almost like I'm a junkie. I refresh the app from inside to you. Um, uh, every interview you give, bro, I'm watching it that day or that night. It's just part of my routine before I go to sleep because uh, I love Miami football. So... The, the recruits that get away, you know, I get pissed. You know, the the recruits we we land as a surprise, like uh, Jaleel Skinner. I'm like, how the hell we do that? You know what I mean? So um, I, I eat, sleep, 
and breathe it, bro. I'm always on your site. I'm always listening to your updates, whether you sneaking inside the practice or you standing outside the gate or you at the stadium. I, I was watching you when you had no facial hair. Now you look like Santa Claus. You know, I, there I'm, you go. There you go. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I, I appreciate it. And some of this stuff has just been new, kind of doing this video stuff. I've always been kind of behind the scenes, just writing. So getting used to this. You're um, real good at it. I want to ask you a question. Are you, you just going, are you flowing, are you flowing off the dome? A lot yeah. of times are you, you know, the updates are flawless. I don't know if you're saying take one. Do you ever sit there and be like, fuck, I got to start oh, yeah. over. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Especially, you know, what I'm bad at finesse is I'm okay. terrible at the beginning of videos. Like, even just doing an intro, like intro new here, like I always kind of struggle at the beginning. Um, and, and if I could just get past those first couple sentences, I, I'm okay. But yeah, a lot of it, you know, and it's not perfect. You know how it is when you do some things, uh, it's not perfect. You wish it could be a little bit better, but yeah, I'm just trying to kind of portray my thoughts, but I'm always self-conscious too, either speaking too fast or too slow or, you know, yeah, whether it's the way I talk or anything or, or the way I look, whatever it is, man. But yeah. I'm just trying to give, people as much information as possible, trying to be creative, right? Like trying to do yeah. something different and maybe try it out. If it works, it does, you know, cool. And if not, you just move along. Um, but I appreciate that support, man. Hey, let's go back. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go back to you as a recruit. Um, you come from Frederick Douglass high school in Atlanta there, mm -hmm. uh, class of 1990, you walked onto Miami, maybe take me through what kind of player you were at that time. Um, you know, my understanding playing corner, but you know, I was playing I, corner and strong safety at the time. Um, I, you know, I had pretty decent grades. And so I had Duke coming to see me, but then, uh, it, it was, there was like, um, I had aspirations of just like, I remember, the, I remember that time where I was think, looking at Auburn and Georgia Tech and Florida State, and I just really wanted to play for Miami and Miami wasn't offering me a scholarship. And I just went on faith. I said, you know, can you curse on this show? I mean, you are, so we're doing it. <laughs> I was just like, fuck it, man. I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to Miami. And uh, I wrote Coach Erickson, Dennis Erickson, a letter. And uh, we had tryouts that summer. And I just remember, Chris, it being like maybe 35 guys up at like 6.30 in the morning at Green Tree. And uh, Coach Rowe was the strength coach back then. And he had everybody running up and down, I guess the suicides, doing 100 yards to 100 yards. He had to do 20 of them before they even got into any type of what's your name? <laughs> what's your skill position? And he wanted everybody on the other side of that goal line under 20 seconds. Well, okay, that's a piece of cake once you get to number eight. But then once you get to 12 and 13, man, it was cats throwing up. It was cats walking off the field. And before I know it, that 30-something people went down to like 16 people. And then we started doing agility and getting into people person personality. Who are you? Where you come from? This and that. And uh, it was almost like auditioning for a play, man. It was, you know, later that afternoon, they put a list up outside the locker room and it had eight names on it. And mine was one of them. And I just thought that was one of the best days of my life. Uh, and I just couldn't wait to tell all my friends and family in Atlanta I was a Miami hurricane. <clears throat> and when then when I got there and got inside of that locker room and then got to know the players and, and see the scholarship players. You know, there was a safety named Daryl Williams and this guy was like 6162, ran a 43 and was probably 215. And he's probably my equivalent to what Sean Taylor was to the new generation. That was the new generation back then, but a monster. I think he played at Miami for two years before he went first round with Seattle. And um, so many just superstar athletes like that. There's a guy that we had coming off the edge back then named Rusty Medeiros that a lot of people don't even know. This guy averaged three sacks a game. White guy. He's a monster. We had Darren Crine and, and Kevin Patrick on the other side. We had white defensive ends terrorizing <laughs> college football. Uh, and then we had Russell Maryland in the middle. You know, we had Shane Curry's, Anthony Hamlis. Our linebackers was, you know, Maurice Crum, Darren Smith, Jesse Armstead, and Michael Barrow. I mean, it, I, I could go on and on about this team. I haven't even mentioned the receivers from Randall Hill to Lamar Thomas to uh, Horace Copeland, Daryl Spencer, 
And then we had Craig Erickson and Gino Toretta as the quarterbacks. And so that 90 team, 91 team, to me, those were some of the best. When we didn't fight each other, because we were fighting the locker room a lot. <laughs> when, they, when these guys, when the Hurricanes weren't fighting each other, we would go out on that field and really whoop somebody's butt, man. So, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about college football. I just used to say, back then, Chris, I used to say, somebody should be filming this. The antics in the locker room and what we do on the field, back, in, back to the antics in the locker room. This needs to be on TV. And lo and behold, man, they made that first 30 for 30 for ESPN. That was what that was what our years. We was all on this group chat, like, hey, that's us. And I was like, I told, I knew back then. I said, man, this is a legendary team. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, first off, the grind of a walk-on. It, that hasn't changed. I mean, it's just it, it's tough. It's ugly, it's, bro. It's it, ugly. It's tough. And especially the playing time, and you know, I I've heard And my name was finesse. So it was hey, super talk about ugly. That. Talk about it's, that though. Imagine, imagine being from Atlanta, Georgia, and the entire team is from from Florida and Texas, and going in and saying, "Hey, what's up? My name Finesse." And um, when I tell you that was not well received, <laughs> it was just like, you know what? I didn't come down here to uh to go soft. I didn't come down here to like prove myself to any of these guys. I'm I'm trying to win a position. And then after a couple of practices, it was uh, people saying, what's up, Finesse? Because it went from I ain't calling him that to what's up, Finesse? You know, and uh, and I'll never forget that some of my freshman uh, buddies that was on the team, the A.C. Tellison's, the C.J. Richardson, um, Malcolm Pearson, they were like, yeah, that's Finesse. And once it took off with them, then the whole team was like, oh, well, I guess so. Because, of course, we had our Warren Saps that was like, I ain't calling nobody for this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. And then it, It's a tough grind. Anybody who chooses to walk on in Miami, you must really love football and really love the Hurricanes because the odds and chances of you playing or starting are very slim, you know. And, and fresh off a title. You know, they won in 89, so you're coming in there. This is a national championship caliber team. It's It's not. Uh, it's different now, it's in, mm -hmm. essentially of where the program is. But for you coming in there, do you? We remember? won in '91. Yep, and then still won it uh, back then and '87. So they were fresh off in this, this run, as good as it was there in college football at that time. Mm -hmm. Finesse, did you have a, a welcome to Miami moment? Um, essentially, with college football, you touched on some names from either from practices where you're like, "Man, this is." I know you were impressed physically on on some guys, but was there a practice or or something that stood out, or maybe even a moment where you're like, "Man, I don't know if I can do this." Uh, stick with this because these guys, I mean, this is just different level stuff here. The uh, the speed of everybody, I was shocked at everybody who could run a 4-3 and a 4-4. That was, that was, that was shocking to me. Um, and then, um, you know, just the athleticism of our receivers. Chris, those one-on-ones, it was like, I mean, everybody was toast. And you just couldn't check Lamar Thomas who could jump out of the freaking gym Horace Copeland, who could jump and do a backflip after he scores a touchdown on you. I mean, they were doing that type of stuff on the field before they came up with the Miami rule about the no taunting. But um, Kevin Williams, who played for the Dallas Cowboys, he was 5'10", 5'11", but could run a 4'4", 4'3". And everybody, it was just, that part was tough. But my funniest welcome to college football, welcome to the Miami Hurricanes was you know how they line up in the tunnel, Chris, before they come out of, through the smoke? I don't know how, but I got to up to the front of the line. I was number three. <laughs> and they was chanting, and you know how, you know, we, we shake the tunnel at the time. And then uh, they, they do the smoke. And, I, and all freshmen are supposed to be in the back. I knew that. Don't ask me how I got up to the number, third, to the number three spot. I ran through the smoke. And the band was angled going this way towards our sideline. So you had to run through and then cut over to go to the sideline. I couldn't see nothing. I just ran out there. And next thing I know, man, I ran right into the trombone player. Because by the time the, the smoke cleared, <laughs> I ran straight into the band. And everybody was laughing, like, get your ass in the back. Don't you ever go up in the front. <laughs> man, you talking about hazing. Them boys let me have it. And when I when the smoke cleared and I looked up and it was my first uh, Orange Bowl experience, 
and I saw the fans, I just froze for a minute, bro. It was literally like, not only did I run into the band, but then once I like got my bearings and started running, I stopped. Well, it was people coming behind me. So I literally got pushed to the ground again. It was like, Vanessa, don't you ever get your ass in the top 50 players. You would be the last one to come out. But uh, that Orange Bowl was rocking. And, of course, everybody says it was a magical place. And, you know, the fan base would always come out in droves. And I hope they can try to recreate that culture. It's hard being at Hard Rock because it's so far from the stadium. But if they can figure that out as far as just the way that the students can really support the team by not having to travel over 45 minutes in traffic, you know, that would be great. That would be a great plus to home games. It, just hearing you talk about that, the smoke and the orange bowl, it's exactly what you didn't want to happen, right? Like you're just trying to make it. You know you're not supposed to be up there. If you just make it, don't fall over. Don't run First into time anybody. out, bro, I run straight into the damn band. <laughs> oh, my God, man. And I mean, it was the – it was – there were people always joking. One thing I can say about the Hurricanes team is there were so many practical jokes and so many teasing and taunting and our, us versus them with on, on the team that, you know, there was a lot of times they just fought each other. But by the time the game came around, it was like I heard a lot of people say on the U documentaries, some of the games were super easy because the, the people you were facing were not better than the people you practiced against. You know, one of the things, and you, I'm sure you get this all the time as a comedian, a guy that, that's been a lot of places with, with things, with, with your comedy, uh, you know, it's, were you funny? Essentially, were you doing things on the team? Were, were you just naturally, were you a guy, you know, cracking jokes and doing these things? And I'm asking because I feel like it could be different with the role you're in uh, with the team, you know. So I'm, I'm a little curious of it's easy for those star players to kind of yeah. run the locker room, so to speak. But were, were you starting to uh, kind of get that thing going? Were, were you always kind of that guy? The star players ran the locker room. And I was not the popular guy on the team. I was not the alpha male on the team. I was not trying to stand out too much. I was just trying to fit in. I'm going to just keep it 100. It wasn't until I left the team, and more importantly, and, and, and some people will know about this, I'm a frat boy. So I pledged Kappa Alpha Psi. Back in those days, being in a fraternity, that was a no-no. So even though people liked me personally, overall as a what we call a Kappa, they did not like that. The, the team thought it was its own fraternity. And, and they just didn't like mixing the two. Even though they loved our parties, they were just like, you know, we are our own fraternity. Why did you join that? But then you get the individual players coming up to you saying, hey, my, my brother is a Kappa. My father is a Kappa. My uncle is a Kappa. So a lot of them wanted to pledge. And I hope that that culture has changed in South Florida because I, I, I still believe that, you know, if it's in your, your, your heritage and in your family, you know, pledge a black fraternity. You know, experience all of, of college football and your college experience and not just one. And, and that's another thing I loved about, uh, you know, being on a team and, and that culture. Dr. Anna Price was very serious about everybody graduating and everybody experiencing and, and, and making sure that, you know, put your grades first because your connections of everybody in the community that was on the team or that's an alumni, or so, they will look out for you. But you got to do the work. You got to network. And that and that probably still goes on to this day. But it was really big back then as far as like a lot of people graduating and being the presidents of companies and starting their own businesses and everybody looking back saying, damn, man, we were some fools back then, you know, and these are the people who didn't make it to the league, you know. Uh, and, and just kind of, again, doing some little research, it seems like you're still active with the Kappa uh, um, and still kind of doing some things. And I think that's Oh, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Uh, I want to see all the noobs and, and, and everybody who was a hurricane and everybody who went to UM, if you have not laughed in a long time and you don't have big fourth, uh, uh, what is it, New Year's Eve plans, that 7th through the 9th, January, first weekend in January, come out to the Daniel Improv, come get your laugh on, me and my boy Kyle Grooms. I'm a pretty dope stand-up comedian. I'm about to shoot my one-hour special, so I'm really excited about that. I just signed a deal with Fox, Chris. I'm, I'm developing my own TV show. So I will get my television sitcom opportunity. And uh, I will be hosting, hosting, Chris, 
the Wendy Williams show, January 14th through, no, January 17th through the 21st. I'm going to be filling in for Wendy Williams. Yeah, I saw that. I was going to ask you about that because I saw the dates kind of change with that. So I'm glad to see you. And you've got a lot going on. Uh, and definitely, I, I sure, I'm sure you're going to be throwing up the U, that kind of thing. So if, if for fans, wear your UM shirts and, and get Don't up. Don't you hate when you see people do that? Or, yeah, can't put it together. Yeah. I hate that. Yeah, you got to go straight <laughs> all the way across. I got you. Hey, uh, you played with certain guys, a, a lot of personalities, the stars. I'm curious because I've seen a picture you've talked about a little bit, but just playing with The Rock um, at that time, do you have a good memory, uh, something that stands out to you with, with, with him? Um, again, you you're played on played for the team for three years. Was there something about him that, that stands out to you and maybe – uh, or maybe it came recently, you know, in, in later years with him. I just remember him. I remember him being super quiet in the locker room. Uh, one of his best friends, I think, was a guy named Anthony Lewis, uh, who played O-line. Um, but uh, I definitely remember everybody calling him Dewey. And I definitely remember the fanny pack. And I definitely remember uh, him being a super nice guy. But I, I, I don't remember the personality of The Rock. And I definitely remember his FSU game when he got a sack. Um, Dwayne was hurt a lot. You know, he, I think he had back problems back then. And, uh, and Warren Sapp was such a monster, bro. Like, he went from tight end. Warren came in as a tight end and had probably the best hands on the team. But, uh, you know, they put him at D-line one day in practice, and that was all she wrote, you know. And uh, so I remember Dwayne, I think, playing behind him. Um, but... People like, uh, you know, Warren, Ray Lewis, Rohan Marley, who, my buddy to this day. I mean, you couldn't have had a better college personality than Rohan Marley, man. Like, he was the first person I saw with a cell phone and had a cell phone in his, in his, in his practice pants <laughs> at practice. <laughs> I heard his cell phone ring like Green Tree one day at the practice. It's so many stories, man. Um, I'm telling you, man, we had some beastly freaking players back then man and um but just a damn good football team when it when it comes to uh me making my transition to entertainment um it was just me going down to the coconut grove improv in miami uh one of the famous comedy clubs in south florida and uh we had a guy named marvin dixon probably a lot of people know marvin dixon in that area and he was the host and uh i did open mic night and it was just me, like, being silly one night and totally separate from UM, college football. It was just me and Coconut Grove saying, I'm going to go up there and do, you know, three minutes. I made up a joke on the spot, Chris, in this uh, joke contest, and my joke won first prize. And the guy was like, and I'll never forget it because it changed my life. He said, hey, man, you got, you got something. You should come back next week and we're going to do this again. What's your name? Fitness? I said, Finesse. He said, all right, we'll come back <laughs> uh, next week, Finesse, and do it again. And uh, I didn't know you were supposed to do the same routine over and over. I just thought you get up there and start talking and magic will happen again. And that second time, Chris, when I say I didn't even get booed, because what's worse than getting booed is complete silence. Nobody said nothing. And that three minutes felt like 35 minutes. And because I had such a great set on my first time, I had invited friends. I had on a shirt and tie. <laughs> I was, and, and when I say nobody even cared enough to boo, I heard one sound. I heard this. I heard somebody do that. I was just like, oh, man. And then after it was over, people didn't even come up to me. The people I invited, they just waved. Hey, man, all right, thanks for them. You know, see you later. I was just like, oh, man. So the dude came up to me and said, hey, man, why didn't you do the stuff you did last, last week? I was like, you can repeat yourself? He was like, yeah. He said, that's your act. Do, do, make a funny act. Do that over and over until it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. And that's what I did. And then I got my, um, that was like in 96. And then in 1999, I was on BET's Comic View. And then uh, I did like three or four seasons of BET's Comic View. And then I... Tracy Morgan was leaving Saturday Night Live. And so by then, people had known me on the comedy circuit. And uh, I'll never forget, Tracy was like, because we had all called each other. We was all on three-way. And Tracy was like, I'm leaving SNL, finesse. 
And I was like, you leaving? He was like, they looking for the new black person. You can be Papa Bear. You can't be Papa Bear. You can only be Baby Bear. I'm Papa Bear. And I was just like, I want to be, I want, I want to be Baby Bear. Let's see how we can do this, man. And next thing I know, Chris, I auditioned and, and uh, they chose me. And me and Keenan Thompson, who's still on the cast, we came in at the same year in 2003. And uh, pretty much that was all she wrote. Went on to the Disney Channel, played on a show called Ant Farm. Uh, played China's dad on the Disney Channel. So a lot of our kids, a lot of my peers and everybody who I, now we have kids and everybody's like, oh man, my child loves you, bro. You know, so if you got kids in between 13, it's on Disney Plus now, but if you got kids in between 13 and 20 something, they know Finesse Mitchell from the Disney Channel. And then just the showtimes and the comedy shows and the comedy specials. I've been blessed, bro. I've been blessed. Now I wish if Dwayne Johnson ever hears this, he could put me in one of his movies. But uh, if not... <laughs> okay <laughs> you still got time and, i've got you know, time i i forgot to uh congratulate you i mean you said you got a lot of things going on man uh, congratulations especially on the show i know that's got to be exciting working on that i, I know you're mm -hmm. excited about uh when you were doing outmatch there so i know you're excited just to, to get that opportunity and do that working with um, tisha campbell yeah yeah and you know and just hearing you do the tracy impression i you know i know you were known for for doing celebrity impressions and I, I can do a lot of time. impressions, Chris. <laughs> I I can I can nail some of them and some of them I can't. <laughs> you do a lot of sports guys too, you know that you've. Yeah, I uh, I used to do Stephen A, and then I and then I annoyed myself doing Stephen A, because every it's just it's just preposterous. Shaq, first of all, Shaq called me. You know what I mean? Everybody, Shaq and Kobe used to always call this dude for whatever reason. He would always right. end every argument with, they called me. <laughs> but um, but I guess my favorite is just to be like, my favorite is like, first of all, y'all come to the improv. Y'all y'all gonna have an amazing time. My, I'm about to shoot my one hour special, bro. And so the set is just amazing. It's wickedly funny. And so I'm very excited about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, and I know a lot goes into that. You know, um, a lot of time goes into putting together uh, mm -hmm. not just the special, but just any, any kind of set, you know, it's, it does take time. You know, it's interesting. You talked about the going to the coconut grove, the improv there. Those are probably mm -hmm. that lesson you got really early on. That's how you, um, as a comedian, how you kind of go, right. You, you, you work mm -hmm. on your set, you get some things that work and you add to it later. It just seems like, um, it was probably such a basic instruction at that time that you could carry with you the, the rest of the way. Hey, comic view. Uh, I, I know SNL, uh, you know, we could talk about that, but I'm curious about Comic View, what, what that was like, especially hometown there. Um, that seemed like a lot of fun. I remember the shows, uh, you know, Get Your Laugh On and, and whatnot, and, and Ricky Smiley, Bruce Bruce, the, the group. Um, what was that like, you know, that experience and, and things that were going on with, with BET right there? Ricky Smiley was my host. He was my host uh, on the first Comic View, and he's a cute dog. So when he introduced me, he knew I was a capper, so he's throwing up the hooks. And I'm coming out being all smooth, doing the Kappa sign. And it was an amazing, an amazing, amazing experience, man, because I was an alternate. I wasn't even scheduled to be on the show. And one of the comics got into a fight with Ricky Smiley. And he said, you're not going on. So now they needed a replacement. So the guy came in and was like, uh, Finesse, you from Atlanta, right? I was like, yeah. He said, well, tell your family you're going on tonight. I was like, what? So I called my family. I said, yo, man, y'all get down here to the Center Stage Theater. And next thing I knew, and I was prepared. That's another thing. I was prepared. My app was solid. And I knew how Comic View worked. If you had great bits, they would chop them up and play them in montages after the season was over. And so, you know, I had... Uh, I just had a killer routine, Chris, just coming out. It, there was no stage fright. I was talking real slow, sounding real country, and had on a, a pink shirt that to this day I say was salmon, but a lot of people say it was pink. But I murdered it. And, um, and what ended up really helping my career is that Comic View took my show, took my 15-minute set, and they chopped it up. And they put it two minutes here on this subject, dating, two minutes here on this subject, people stealing two minutes here on this and it just it just got me really really popular and ignorance is bliss because i didn't know any better all i knew was i was on comic view so i was like well time to move to la i'm on tv <laughs> so i took my 2500 dollars and moved to la and uh one of one another one of my famous jokes is you ever find out you live in a bad neighborhood by watching a movie 
And that's what I found out. I lived in this area called a jungle. I just thought it was an affordable living <laughs> place, man. But I saw my house on training day. I was like, wait a minute. That's my neighborhood right there. <laughs> I live in the jungle. And next thing I know, man, it's a grind. There, there's no way for anybody who wants to do stand-up comedy, there's no way or no blueprint to make it to the top. There's no social media back then. There was no YouTube back then. You know, it was just like, you know, you get up there, you get stage time, you get booed, you get booed. And Miami was a hard place. Miami was a hard place to do some comedy. Studio 183, Peppermints, Black Knight at the, my, at the Coconut Grove Improv. It, it, you know, people would boo, you know. But um, the Mike Epps, the Ricky Smiley's, the Bruce Bruce, D.C. Curry, Cheryl Underwood, like all these people who are household names now, they were kind of like my mentors when I was coming up. And everybody was like, Finesse, you got something, man. And so this guy, Bill Bellamy, he started taking me on the road with him. And uh, next thing I know, Bill Bellamy looked at me and said, yeah, you, you too funny to uh, you good. You know, you, I was like, what? He, he, so he basically fired me, but he was basically saying, go out there and fly, you know. And next thing I know, like I said, Tracy Morgan was leaving SNL and, and that opportunity came up. And once you get on SNL, it's, once again, it's about networking. And I did three seasons on SNL. But everybody who I met and everybody who I stayed in touch with, you know, they, they mega stars. And so it became easy to, to make a phone call and or go in and audition for somebody's project. And it was like, Finesse, we love you, you know, because they just knew me from the circuit, you know. And yep. here we are, like 20 years later. Um, I, I was kind of going through the, the seasons for SNL. Tons of great hosts, um, guests at that time. I'm curious maybe if there's one that stood out to you. Halle Berry. Yeah, I was wondering that right at the beginning, too. <laughs> Halle Berry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, I, was one, I was thinking, I was like, are you going to go Holly? You're going to go Snoop? Those were kind of the two, but yeah, Holly. And that was early on. That was that first Snoop, season. Snoop Dogg was amazing because that was the first time I saw anybody smoke weed in our studio. And he had Bishop Don Magic Juan with him as his spiritual advisor. And we had this sketch that didn't come on, but Donald Trump was doing The Apprentice. And so Snoop, we wrote a sketch for Snoop called The Apemptus. And so... Instead, <laughs> instead of saying you're fired, he would pretend to smack a girl and be like, you're tired, you know? <laughs> so yeah, for whatever reason, NBC was like, we can't air that. <laughs> but uh, he was great. We're friends to this day. Halle Berry was great. Uh, that's the first time I did the Starkeisha character in a sketch with Halle Berry and Maya Rudolph. Um, and, uh, you know, Jimmy Fallon, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Maya Rudolph, um, Kenan Thompson, Fred Armisen. That was like a dope cast. Jason Sudeikis, Andy Samberg, Kristen Wiig. Like all these people are like juggernauts in the business now. And, and, and people, it's also a testament to, testament to my University of Miami, Orange and Green, the U never quit, never say die, because I'm like, you know what? My time is coming. And this, before the COVID, it was an amazing, amazing uh, time in my career because a lot of stuff was happening. And now that COVID is like winding down, these same opportunities are coming back. So, you know, sometimes it may take you 25 years to get to where you're going. But if you talk to Morgan Freeman, he'll tell you, hey man, anybody pay attention to me till I was 50 years old. <laughs> no, finesse. <clears throat> finesse, let me tell you. Never give up. When I talked to my friend Andy Dufresne, he said that he was going to get out of Shawshank one way or the other. And lo and behold, he did it. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. But um, Bernie Mac, all these people, man, they, you know, Literally 50 something. Bernie Mac didn't get his show till after Kings of Comedy, but he had been doing comedy for 24 years before that. So, you know, anything that's like entertainment, the internet helps. It, 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 it makes people leapfrog a whole bunch of people. You can literally become a star yourself by turning your phone like, towards you. And we're old school. We may do an intro 10 times because it's not right. But these new kit, these new jacks, bro. They they take their phone, 
they go, they post it. They don't care how they look. They don't care if they have food right here. They don't care if the collar was crooked. It's about the consistency and the frequency. And so I'm learning that. I'm learning to try, try not to be a perfectionist and to just, you know what I'm saying? Just let these videos fly. That's what I like about your videos, man. Like, it just seems like not only are they consistent, but I want the new updates. I want the new recruiting updates. I want the, the injury reports. I want who's going to go to the league, you know, and who's thinking about staying for another year. And um, I'm happy that a lot of people in the last couple of years have decided to, like, come back for another year because that helps the program, you know. So that's that's me being selfish as far as wanting the U to get back on top. But a lot of times we, we couldn't compete because people was coming out at juniors and they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have come out. You know, what's the point of going fifth and sixth and seventh round when you can go first and second, you know? I don't know. That's me. Oh, you got it right. Uh, Finesse, your time is valuable. I appreciate it. I appreciate the support, man. I, I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, how you enjoy stuff, I that's one of the things that helps is, is getting that support and from the channel, from the, from the people, that feedback has been good because, again, self-doubt pops in. You're always trying to make things better and, and kind of navigate through things. Uh I, I'm happy for you. You got a lot going on. You can support finesse at the Danny Improv January 7th through 9th. I, I know you're going to put together a great set. Um, mm -hmm. Looking forward to just everything else you're doing. You know, like you said, the Wendy Williams show coming up. Uh, you got your special coming up, show you're working on. And I'm glad you, you took time to do this. You shared great stories. Uh, the celebrity impressions were great, man. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll be in touch, man. Appreciate Absolutely. You. Everybody in the 305 954 561. Go to finessemitchell.com if you want to come see a live comedy show. It's a perfect date night. It's a perfect reunion. I got a lot of people from UM coming out. I got a lot of people who went to FIU who wish they went to UM. That's going to come out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, y'all come see me live, 7th through the 9th of January. It's going to be a dope time. And uh, hurricanes, hurricanes, hurricanes. If you own that team, put in the work. Put in the work. Linebackers work on lateral movement and first steps. Got to take better angles to the ball. And you got to wrap up. I mean, that's just football one-on-one. -on -one. You got to make a solid tackle. I do not like DBs and, and linebackers putting their shoulder into people and thinking that's a tackle. Y'all are bouncing off these guys. I don't know if y'all noticed, but we don't look as strong as a lot of these teams we're playing. And so we have, they're, they're running right through these, these shoulder tackles. You got to wrap up. You got to take a better angle and uh, you got to play as one and going to the NFL isn't about wearing a Hurricanes jersey, man. You really got to produce on that field. Got to come in and make an impact. Jalen Phillips, you got to come in and make an impact. You know, the NFL isn't promised for everybody. These are the best years of your life. Everybody, if you own that Miami Hurricanes football team, you'll never find a better band of brothers that's going to be your friends for a life but when you out there on that field man be a warrior leave it all out there and tackle 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 play as one keep your head in the game and o-line gotta do better that's it coach mitchell out coach mitchell baby i'm a fan that's all i can say i'm a fan and we, and, and i like what mario crystal ball is going to do because mark my words the 2023 recruiting uh uh class is going to be a monster it's going to be a monster you, i already can feel it it's going to be a monster and the small class that we have in 2022 right now these boys are some dogs so they're going to definitely help and uh contribute and we landed some and it's not done it's not done I, I i love the fact that we're about to have some surprises coming up in the next couple of months with people committing to the u and um and then uh that's it man that's it go canes all right, man. I appreciate it. You were great. You were great. Thanks, you were bro. good. <laughs>